How to be an engineer. Step one, learn convolutions. All right, this should be easy. Okay, let's not give up yet. There are many practical scenarios where convolutions are useful. And funnily enough, once you understand the fundamental motivation behind convolutions, they are not as convoluted as the name might lead you to think. Today I hope to get you to realize that the convolution is an elegant way of describing many of the systems and technologies that we use. But for now, let's ignore the physics and engineering. Today we'll be talking about bakeries. Let's say you have a bakery in town that you really like, but they have this strange policy on cookies. If you give one dollar on one day, you have to wait until the next day to get a cookie, but you get a second cookie the day after. So remember this, one dollar in, two cookies out. The idea itself is very simple. So let's start putting some numbers around it. Here we have a timeline that shows the number of days that pass. Here we have the function d of t, d for dollar, which tells us how many dollars we're giving to the bakery every single day. Here is the function c of t, c for cookies, which tells us how many cookies we receive every day. And here is the function b of t, b for bakery, which is the bakery's response to us paying one dollar. b of t is what we would call the impulse response of the bakery. So from now on, I will use the terms b of t or impulse response interchangeably. There's nothing stopping us from putting two impulse responses on the same number line if we give an extra dollar a couple of days later. No matter where we put the second dollar, we get the same response. We get to slide around the response along the number line without fear of the bakery changing its policy. If you can slide the impulse response all over the time axis without having it change, you can call this system time invariant. The bakery's response to your dollar does not vary with time. Now the position we have here is a very curious one. What happens if we take the red response and slide it one more space to the left? In other words, what happens if we give one dollar to the bakery two days in a row? Feel free to pause and take a guess yourself before I continue. Ready? So not only do the responses of the bakery slide around on the timeline, they also stack on top of one another. If you give two dollars on one day, then you get two cookies the next day, and two cookies the following day, because the responses stack completely on top of one another. However, we don't have to think of this as stacking anymore. What's actually happening here is that the responses are scaling. I scaled my input of one dollar to two dollars, so the bakery scales up its response by two. This scaling is a natural result of the stacking property that we already presented earlier. When a system has this stacking and scaling property, we call that a linear system. Linear simply means that the responses stack and they scale. So remember this, stacking and scaling. So now we have two fancy words to describe our bakery. It is time invariant and it's linear, or linear time invariant. But remember, even though this is a lot of syllables and can be a little intimidating, all it means is that the system slides, stacks, and scales its responses. Slides, stacks, and scales. Remember that now. Now, let's say you move out of town and you find another bakery. This bakery has a different policy. If you chip in one dollar, it responds with three cookies one day, two cookies the next day, and one cookie the following day. This is what the linear time invariant properties would look like for this bakery. Let's observe a couple more combinations of impulse responses. Hey, wait a minute. Linear. You know what that reminds me of? Linear algebra! If a system is linear, which means it stacks and it scales, it is usually a good idea to go and investigate and see if there are any connections with matrices and vectors. And we will do that right now. Now, if you don't know what matrix multiplication is yet, then you might struggle with this next bit. But if you do know how to multiply matrices, then you will do just fine. 
Now, we were talking about cookies, and dollars, and bakeries, so where are the vectors? Well, actually, they've been here the whole time I've been showing you, they're all up here. As per convention, we're gonna tip these vectors over so that they're standing straight up, with time increasing as we go down the vector. Also, I will now put the dollar function on the right and the cookie function on the left. In linear algebra, it is typical for the input to go on the right and the output to appear on the left. And we know that there's a linear relationship between the C vector and the D vector. So perhaps we need to multiply the D vector, the dollar vector, by a matrix to get the C vector. So with the knowledge that we have now about how the responses slide, stack, and scale on top of one another, we can figure out what this matrix is. Let's start with a simple example, with the dollar vector being 1, 0, 0, 0 all the way down, which means that we give $1 one day and don't give it any more dollars. And we already know what this first column looks like because we know what happens when we give this bakery $1. It will be a copy of the bakery's impulse response. We can do the same thing if we just move the one down, if we just give $1 on the next day. And we receive the same response, but it shifted down a bit. Because obviously if you give $1 a day later, then your response is going to be a day later. We can keep repeating this pattern for all the other columns of the matrix. For now, we will arbitrarily make this a 7x7 matrix, but keep in mind that this matrix can be any size. Within each column, you just get a shifted version of the bakery's response, which is 3, 2, 1. Along the rows, you also get copies of the impulse response. You also get a copy of 3, 2, 1. So this matrix has a symmetry along its anti-diagonal. Since a matrix multiplication is a dot product between rows and columns, time moves left to right along the rows. So the rows of the matrix are reflected in shifted copies of the impulse response. Now that we have an idea of what the matrix looks like, we can generalize this expression. So that for any sequence of dollars we give to any bakery, we can predict the sequence of cookies we receive. Generalizing the input is rather simple, and so is generalizing the impulse response matrix. Since the elements of the output vector is a sequence of dot products between the input and the matrix rows, we can express the output vector like this. This negative sign reflects the impulse response, and this negative sign shifts it. As time increases, the shift increases, so we know the output is a function of the shift. But how is it possible to have b of t minus t? Well, when you apply a linear operator to a function of time, that unit of time will be cancelled out and replaced with another unit, such as in the Fourier transform, where time is replaced with frequency. In this case, the original time variable is being replaced by another time variable, which can be pretty confusing at first. We must distinguish the two different time variables with another symbol. Let's express the input time variable as tau and the output time variable with the t. Now we have a general expression of the output vector, which is a single dot product that is a function of the shift t. If we write out this dot product more explicitly with the sigma notation, this is what that expression would look like. And if we want to express this whole system with continuous functions, we can morph that sigma sum into an integral. Does this look familiar? This integral is called the convolution. We can use an asterisk to represent it as an operator between two functions. This expression is useful for any linear time invariant systems out there. Let's take a look at some real world examples. If you are an electrical engineer, you will run into capacitors and inductors, which are components that store energy. In other words, it is in their very nature to stack and scale their inputs. Even if you do not know the dirty details of the math, the qualitative behavior of capacitors and inductors should lead you to intuitively understand why convolutions are applicable. Have you ever seen this footage? This is Tacoma Narrows Bridge, and this rocking motion is the bridge's response to the wind. It collapsed in 1940.
Even though it is so counterintuitive to think that the wind can blow away a rigid structure, this happens because the bridge was able to accumulate and stack its vibration responses to the wind. And when enough small responses stack up, they can rock the bridge. There are so many more interesting problems and ideas about convolution that I want to share, but if I explain them all, this video would be too long. So instead, I'll list them out here in order of increasing difficulty. Hopefully, these give you something fun to think about. That's all for today, I'll see you in the next video.